we chat about a lot of stuff. Life, love, you know, all the good shit. And we are talking we were just sitting in the kitchen talking about nostalgia. The old games, how they don't make them like they used to. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they don't. So we're, but, try, we're trying to pick apart, like, what is actually just us being nostalgic about when we didn't know about games and we were discovering it for the first time and actually trying to decipher what they don't actually do anymore. Right. What was good that they don't do anymore. And so we, we kind of passed up on a game. Normally, nostalgia is kind of a soft spot for me, and I'll normally give it a go. And so we passed on a game, and the game's been out for about a month or two. I am Setsuna. Yeah. We passed up on it. And if anybody's ever, you know, been listening to a couple videos on our channel, we love the shit out of JRPGs. Everything about that game, we should not have passed up at all, but we did. And there's a reason for that. Not because it looks like shit or anything like that. For me, it's just the price range. Well, the price, yeah. I mean, as 40 bucks is a hefty price for what it is. But... Here is the thing I think a lot of developers kind of misunderstand about uh, nostalgia. Nostalgia is all fine and dandy. Uh, it's always nice to look back and think about the the games that turned you into a gamer, the games that you fell in love with that m brought you to where you're at today. The problem with nostalgia that they seem to forget is those games, when they came out, weren't games copying games of the past they were pushing the envelope yeah my favorite games are super nintendo rpgs when those came out those were state of the art they were doing stuff nobody's ever done before chrono trigger was doing stuff nobody's ever done before final fantasy 6 was doing stuff nobody's ever done before lufia 2 was doing stuff nobody's ever done before and a lot of people seem to forget that and so when they came up with, you know, when they were like, oh, we're going to make I Am Setsuna, and it's inspired heavily by Chrono Trigger, Chrono Trigger wasn't heavily inspired by anything. Nah. They were and making their own game. It's like the way they approached I Am Setsuna, and again, I'm just approaching it from like the synopsis that I have of it, where you're trying to protect this girl who is giving her life for some greater cause or whatever. It's just... There's a certain ground where I can appreciate, yes, I'm an older gamer, and there's things that, you know, I was discovering for the first time with older games that now they're not new anymore. But at the same time, there was a lot of things that I still look at, and it's like, they're not doing that anymore. You know what I mean? Like, they made Final Fantasy XIII, it was so on rails, and they had a very basic concept of story and stuff like that. But when you start thinking about, like, Chrono Trigger where they were jumping timelines and going into the future and stuff like that. You start talking about, like, Mega Man, the 2D side-scroller, where fucking this dude is, like, traversing, like, ruined skyscrapers and stuff like that and fighting his brethren and stuff like that. It's, it, they've adopted this mentality where they kind of latch on to uh, a gritty, realistic value of story and gameplay, which is fine, and it's been fun for a little while, but now I'm starting to look back and realize that you guys have abandoned this entire other thing that I loved about games that doesn't exist anymore. I think because a, a lot – I think when it comes to things like Chrono Trigger or Xeno Gears or things like that, trying to mix – trying to mix that kind of fantasy world, keep it somewhat grounded and gritty but still like epic and, you know – you know, uh, have it be bigger than life itself. That that's a hard mix. You know, that's a hard mix. And anytime somebody tries to do it, they're always influenced by games that have already done it. Yeah. And so, and so what? You know, I think what we should be doing is trying to recognize the games that are going to be looked at in the same light as a Chrono Trigger or a Final Fantasy VII, and you know, fifteen years from now. Yeah, you know what games are? I, I, what games are going to be looked at? You know, like they really pushed the envelope when they, you know, when they came out. You know, something like a Skyrim or a Witcher Three, or you know what I mean? Games that that are going to have that kind of status down the road, and people, yeah. are, and then in fifteen twenty years, people are going to be you know inspired by Witcher Three, and we're going to make this game. Well, and, that's the thing is, I think that that's kind of 
my beef is they're, they're kind of reinventing themselves. As far as the new technology goes with, like, the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4, they've had to find a new way to create a world and add detail and still kind of, like, elevate it to a sense of where it's still grandiose and, like, there's this amazing story that just fucking is larger than life and stuff like that. Uh-huh. I, feel like they've, I feel like they've gotten to the point where they are able to build these worlds with – you know, style and, you know, depth, but they haven't been able to take it to these grandiose levels. But now that we're getting further along, they've already established a baseline, and so now they can take it there. And so I'm excited to see what they're going to do with that sort of thing. I, I think I – and not only that, watching uh, companies or a series that we've, you know, grown up and loved and actually watching them grow. And perfect example is Final Fantasy 15 coming out. Uh, we hated 13, but I've always, always loved Final Fantasy. And to watch them take the Final Fantasy, kind of keep the style and kind of keep the same spirit of Final Fantasy, but throw it in an open world game with action RPG combat, but still have, you know, like the magic and the summons and this and that. Like, I, I think they're really going to hit it out of the park with that one. Because they were able to retain their spirit, they were able to retain their identity as Final Fantasy, but still grow and uh, augment themselves with a modern concept of a really great. But that's game, what I'm saying. I know? feel like I feel like other companies and other games have like already established what's popular and what's new as far as the open world technology goes, and they've adopted it. And they're like, okay, now we know. Now that there's a baseline, we can understand where we have to come from from the beginning. And now we're going to start to do what Final Fantasy should be. You know what I mean? So that's why that's what makes me the most excited. You can see it in the summons. You know what I mean? Oh, God. When I first saw Ramu, I was fucked. Yeah. I haven't been blown away about a, a summon or something like magic since Final Fantasy VII. That's what I haven't I'm saying. been blown away you like that since then. You could see in the 13 where they had summons, but they just really didn't know what to do. They turned them into vehicles and stuff. Um, and they were yeah. just like, we, we, we really don't know what yeah. we're supposed to do you with know, these. And, uh, you know, and I forgot that they did that with their summons, and that makes yeah. me hate the game even more. I yeah. remember that, and I hate that. But that's that. the thing is that like they now see the baseline. They, not, they now see what they have to do to establish a, you know, a basic game. And then they can throw their own elements into that, and they look like they're doing that. Oh, dude! It and and it, it would it would bring me nothing but absolute joy to see Final Fantasy fifteen absolutely fucking succeed. Yeah. And to see them decide, fuck the bullshit, fuck the other nonsense we're trying to do, fuck trying to find some like weird indie developer to remake a Gex game <laughs> or whatever fucking you know. Uh, intellectual properties that they own these days and really go back to, you know, their roots of JRPGs and just fucking being king of the market. You know what I I mean? I would love nothing more to see Square Enix. I would love nothing more than to see a new Final Fantasy every few years or a new kick-ass RPG or even if they're like, hey, we want to try something, you know, kind of out of left field and have it just be absolutely fucking gold. Yeah. You know, when the Final Fantasy Tactics came out, that was completely out of left field. Yeah. They never did anything like that. Absolutely Par- amazing. Parasite game. Eve was the same Parasite thing. Eve, absolutely. Uh, Vagrant Story. Yeah. It was like everything they did was fucking gold. They had one or two kind of duds. They had some, um, I don't even know what you would call this genre. I guess the shooter genre. They had this game, um, PlayStation 1. I forgot what it was called. I'm sure you can Google it. Uh, it was like a side, it was like a 2D game where you were like a mech but it was like one of those like arcade uh spaceship kind of uh, shooter yeah, it was games. like ein hazar or something like that like ein hanzer or something yeah i saw about. something like that where it was like and i didn't really care for that but i think that's more of a preference i don't really care about those kind of games but they even had um what what was that game uh it was like a fighting game but it was like a, a 3d fighting game where you ran around but you got to be like cloud and Tifa and stuff like that. Oh, uh, yeah, Dissidia. No, 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 not to say. This was on PlayStation 1. Really? Yeah, it was called, like, Air Guys or something like that. Oh, yeah, and you got to play as fucking, like, Sephiroth. Yeah, right? Sephiroth and Cloud. And, like, it wasn't the best thing, but it was, like, really fucking cool. Yeah. But they were they were fearless. Yeah. They would try new stuff. And they would still, even when it wasn't the best thing they ever done, it was still pretty successful. Because they were they were, they were on point then. 
And a lot of companies, when they came to JRPGs, were. Tri-Ace was on point. Star Ocean 2, the second story, was an amazing game. Yeah. You know, At- Atlas, well, Atlas has always been kind of on point, and they're always, they're, they're always kind of weird about their shit, but they had, like, Cartia, and they had the Personas. I mean, really what it comes down to is nostalgia's nice. And, and I and I understand why people want to try or eh, people developers want to try and tap into that because we all have, you know, very warm feelings about the games that turned us into gamers. Yeah. But what we have to understand is nine times out of ten, we have warm feelings about those games because nobody else was doing games like That's that the at the time. I guess so. I guess what I miss the most is just that that swagger. You know what I mean? Like they just could walk into a room and be fucking the, the I, life of the party. I, like I, I I miss the fearlessness. Yeah. I miss people not afraid to take risks. Back then, gaming wasn't the multi-billion-dollar media industry it was, so they had nothing to do but whatever they wanted. It's like anything early. It's like a. Rock music in the 60s and 70s when you had bands like Pink Floyd who their influences were jazz, but they had nobody before them, so they just did whatever they wanted, and they set the foundation. When Square Enix was making games and Super Nintendo and PlayStation one day, they weren't making games that other people have made before them. Nobody, They had no influence, so they made whatever they wanted. Yeah. And look at what happened. And so now you got games like I Am Setsuna, who's not doing that. They're trying to make games like what Square Enix was doing yeah. in the early days. It's a copy of a copy of a copy. Exactly, like and and, and and it's all nice and fine, but you're you're not gonna get what you think you're you think you're gonna achieve. You're not yeah. gonna get that. You're not gonna get the status of Chrono Trigger. Chrono Trigger got the status because it was doing something nobody else ever was doing. Yeah. And so I think that's an important thing to remember about nostalgia is that it's nice. But when you use it as a foundation, you're setting yourself up for – you're just going to be a shell. You're not going to be filled with any real substance. Yeah. Name the last game that was completely – that their foundation was built off of nostalgia and na- name me one game that was actually really good because of it. I don't even have an example. It, nobody does because there's probably not the really only one, one out that, there. Yeah, the only one that looks halfway decent would be that one that we saw that is kind of modeled after Shadow of the Colossus but has like survival elements. Oh, yeah, that. Pray for the Gods. But even then, I can say that now because I haven't played it, so I don't know. Yeah. You know that, could, that game could end up And not only that, it's not like Shadow of Colossus is a whole genre. You it's, know what I mean? Yeah. We're talking about JRPGs. I am said sooner, yeah, they're modeled off Chrono Trigger, but that's really modeled off a whole fucking genre that's kind of become really niche now, you know? Yeah. It's not like JRPGs are being pumped out left and right anymore. Nah. And we got some we got a couple good ones, but it's it's so far and few between that we get so fucking excited about them. Uh, Final Fantasy 15 and Persona 5, our fucking panties are just soaking over here because know, of those right? games. Yeah. That like if I, if I knew I could have those games in 2 months, I wouldn't give a shit about the whole holiday season. It's pathetic, too, because I put some sorry-ass time into games where it's just, like, because they're JRPGs, like, I played them, but it, they're, they're... They're not good. Yeah, like, Nino Cooney, The Wrath of the White Witch, and stuff, and the Tales games. Yeah, I like, mean, the Tales games they're are... They're not bad ta- games, Tales games are, like, the Call of Duty of JRPGs uh, right now. Yeah. They just pump the one, one out a year, and it's, like, it's just... They're not even really that good. Nino Cooney looked good, but it, as far as a game and story... There, there, there was some pretty deep moments in the beginning, but like that's where it began, and that's where it ended. Yeah. I, I mean, JRPGs, I mean, it's it sucks that we don't that it's not you know. It really does, and I'm hoping there's a resurgence after this. Once 15 and uh, Persona 5 so. comes out, like I'm hoping everybody I, I, jumps on I, that band. I, I really hope so, man. I would love nothing more than to see that. I want every company to do it. I would love to see. I would love to see a rock star develop fucking like JRPG. You know, <laughs> like. God, I couldn't even imagine what that would look like. I mean, I guess if I really sat down here and thought about it, I could. But after five, I'm just like, don't do a JRPG. <laughs> don't, don't do that. I mean, I love my Western RPGs, dude. I love, you know, Bethesda puts out a game, I buy it, guaranteed. CD Projekt Red puts out a game, I fucking buy it, guaranteed. But uh, I would, I, you know, I my roots are JRPG. Yeah. That's what, that's where my roots are. Anyways. Like, subscribe, don't like. It's all good to us. We're out.